Hello everyone and welcome to this consortium seminar arranged by the Consortium for Research on Terrorism and International Crime. I am Rita Agusa Knudsen, Senior Researcher here at NUPI and the Managing Director of the Consortium, which I have together with Professor Tuur Bjergo at CREX. Today we are very pleased to take a look at the phenomenon that we at the Consortium have a special interest in, namely the relationship between mental health and involvement in violent extremism, terrorism, radicalization and the implications for practice, what we know about this relationship. We have had seminars addressing this topic earlier, but given both the rapid development within both research and practice on this, and the possible changes brought about on this landscape by the pandemic, we thought it would be a good time to return to the topic with an update of where things stand from the perspective of research, practice and ethics, especially in the pandemic. And for this, we have a wonderful lineup. Monica Lloyd is a forensic psych psychologist with a unique clinical experience from the UK Prison and Probation Service and the development of risk assessment tool for the space. For the last 10 years, she has been part of the Center for Applied Psychology at Birmingham University and has developed professional guidelines for working ethically with terrorist offenders in the UK and in Europe as well through the Radicalization Awareness Network in ethical guidelines for working for PCDE in mental health care. Eva Maria Jimenez Gonzalez is a doctor in clinical and forensic psychology and the head of the Institute for Forensic Psychology in the Ministry of Justice in Spain. She co-chairs the Radicalization Awareness Network Mental Health Working Group and is a member of the World Health Organization Mental Health Unit, among many other roles. Eva is also the director of the International Master in Clinical and Forensic Psychology at the International University for Menendez Pelayo. Anders Bo Christensen is a special advisor at the Danish Center for Prevention of Extremism and also a RAM expert. For several years, he had advised municipalities, police and other actors on preventing and countering violent extremism, including risk assessment training, local organizing and coordinating between stakeholders for knowledge-based practices in the field. After having worked for many years as a teacher, he developed at both Copenhagen Municipality and the National Board of Social Services individual level gang exit strategies and anti-recruitment prevention. Before we start, I should mention that this event will be live streamed and recorded and placed on the NUPI and Consortium website, provided no technical difficulties. And I would encourage you all to please submit your questions through the Q&A function in Teams. The order will be as follows. Monica will start. Uh, Eva Maria will then continue and Anders Bull Christensen will then finish and then we have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. So with this, I will just say, floor is yours, Monica. Oh, thank you. OK. Right, well, hello, everybody. I'm very, very pleased to, to, to be here with you all. Um, I wanted just to say a little bit about how I came to have the views that I have about the importance of ethical practice. Um, and to stress that although I'm now working at a university in essentially in an academic role, um, most of my career has been spent working in prisons with serious violent offenders. Um, and three of those years have been dedicated to working specifically with terrorist offenders. Um, and that work is face to face and when you work face to face rather than from open source data, as many academics do, uh, you have a very different experience of um, the, 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 the group that, that you're trying to understand and, and whose behaviour you're, you're trying to make sense. Um, so I've spent, I suppose, in 12, about 12 years working face to face and another 12 years in the prison inspectorate in the UK. Now, the prison inspectorate was established to safeguard the individual rights of prisoners. Uh, being imprisoned by the state. So I developed the, uh, I already had, but I consolidated um, some, some very uh, focused 
beliefs about the importance of balancing the power of the state against the rights of individuals. And I'm particularly aware that with terrorist offenders, the clue being in the word terror, that they do gender a lot of fear. And where national security is threatened, that the state tends to gather more power to itself. So when I've been working with terrorist offenders, um, I've been very, very concerned to um, be sure that as a representative of the state, I am operating ethically and employing all the tenets of procedural justice, which we will talk about now. Um, yeah, security, as I said, in, in moments when national security is, is threatened, um, it tends to trump individual rights. So terrorist attacks on civilians elicit a strong emotional response, and this can lead to implicit bias against the alleged perpetrators. That's in those of us who work with them as well as the general public. And it is stoked by sensational media reporting. And the counter-terrorist legislation tends to become more inclusive and more punitive, such that, and this certainly applies in the UK and I know elsewhere, pathway behaviours can be criminalised. So being on the pathway, showing an interest, getting engaged in an extremist ideology can in itself be a crime, at which you can be prosecuted for, which really is a fundamental threat to our um, within democratic countries to our sense that we have a right to believe whatever we believe, as long as we don't pursue those beliefs through violence. Suspects can be detained without trial and all sorts of coercive interrogation can be used. So risk aversion becomes the default position of those who carry the risk. So uh, police intelligence agencies, practitioners in the PCVE space, as, as I know there are many today, this is the focus of this talk. Um, judges and correctional staff, we all operate within this risk averse environment and need to be very aware and police ourselves in terms of the quality of attention and the objectivity which we're operating with. Um, the danger is that individual person centred management can give way to risk avoidance. <clears throat> And there is overall a danger of political hegemony in the risk aversion. Now, hegemony is defined as the domination of the ruling class based on collusion rather than coercion or force. Um, and we are in great danger of colluding with our governments um, if we don't retain our own separate ethical awareness. So, um, and the collusion with government can take the form of pathologizing political violence. And I think that's very important today when we're looking specifically at mental health. Um, it's it, it's it's easy, but never accurate to simply imply that um, offending is the result of problems with mental health. That's clearly too simplistic. We need to be aware of pathologizing political violence, particularly when it's engaged in so widely globally as a way of solving conflict by state actors. We need to be aware of criminalising beliefs because of our democratic values, which stress the importance of accommodating different beliefs. We, there is a danger of stigmatising by race, faith, culture or class. And then the danger which we see very much in the criminal justice system as treating potential perpetrators as a homogenous high risk group now, I'm speaking from the perspective of the criminal justice system. I know many of you are not working within it, but actually in the space before that, when there are concerns about the um, presentation of, of individuals and when you're asked to make an assessment, um, the, what we're being asked for is an individual focused assessment. Um, and we need to have, if you like, the um, the capacity to speak truth to power when others are concerned about risk and not wanting to be persuaded that the risk may be less than very high. It's it's incumbent upon us to be able to speak truth to power and tell it the way it is 
and make risk discriminations between those who are very concerning and those who are less concerning. There's also the danger of loss of citizenship as we've seen through returning foreign fighters. Now the challenges of risk assessments are, I won't go into this in, in, in in, in depth, but many of you are being asked to, to make risk assessments and the things we do need to have in the forefront of our mind in order to practice ethically are that predicting the occurrence of low base rate violence, particularly pre-crime, pre is very, very difficult because um, there are very, very few people who carry out this form of violence. Um, and to be able to identify in, in advance who might be the, the one person in several thousand. Um, you, um, you, would be, you would be more accurate if you said nobody's ever going to commit the offence because you might be wrong in one out of several thousand cases, but you that way you, you um, avoid the mistake of false positives. So it, it is a very difficult thing to do scientifically and in terms of the statistics. Um, intervening pre-crime, especially with young people, is something which we have scruples about because young people, like we were all young once, go through a process of being very idealistic in their thinking um, and very energised to produce change. And some of our views can be very passionately held um, and, and perhaps it very focused, over-focused. But that doesn't mean to say that we would go on to act violently to promote them. Um, there is a dis distrust of um, PCVE on the part of, of, of those who are being scrutinised. When this is delivered by those who are seen as state actors, if an individual is feeling alienated from the state um, and doesn't identify with the government of their country, they're obviously going to be biased against being treated objectively and it's up to us to be able to observe the tenets of procedural justice which we'll come on to in order to um, behave fairly and with respect and gain the trust of people who and then evidence suggests that that then leads to better quality intelligence information. Um, there is the potential of risk aversion again when those who are doing the assessments are white, privileged and um, have an, um, an implicit bias against those who are threatening the status quo. And another very important risk that we need as uh, p practitioners to be aware of and, and mindful of and guard against is that although we're assessing individuals, ind individuals uh, beliefs are very much dependent on the social political context and the and in in which those beliefs develop um, and we can't blame the individual um, entirely without understanding the context which actually provides the vehicle and the opportunity for an individual to develop extremist beliefs. Protective factors can also be overlooked because we over focus on risk factors, but the risk factors are very generic and really in, in as much as they're generic to awful, a, a lot of um, issues that, that manifest in substance misuse and crime and mental health problems. Um, and what makes them specific to uh, the, uh, the terrorist context um, is um, very important to identify because it's in the protective factors rather than the risk factors that the real explanation that informs the formulation can be found because the generic risk factors will are very include a huge number of people but the protective factors can be very distinctive to uh, those who are um, engaging in, in, in extreme ideologies. And the individual risk factors can become over determinate, deterministic, specifically, of course, in terms of mental health. Um, if an individual is presenting with mental health issues and um, a, 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 um, 
an interest in, in engaging, then the danger is that you look at the mental health problem and tell yourself you found the solution and the explanation for everything. Now, um, ethical guidance for mental health practitioners working with extremism in the UK, the paper which was referred to by Rita that um, I, I produced for the Radicalisation Awareness Network, um, stresses the four principles, universal pr principles of mental health, good mental health practice, which are respect, responsibility, competence and integrity. And just to give you some examples um, about that, um, they are being aware of your own cultural perspective and the unconscious biases embedded in the science and language of Western psychology, which we are now actually becoming um, a lot more mindful of um, since the events of um, last summer uh, and all the discourse that, that has followed that. Um, we also need to remain mindful about how our practice may be viewed from the communities from which our clients are drawn so that we are not using labels or making um, assumptions uh, that may be experienced as stigmatizing and alarmist we need to ensure regular supervision for ourselves to reflect on how current geopolitical events may be affecting our attitudes towards our clients um, that stresses again the context in which things occur and what's going on geopolitically very much affects what manifests within individuals at a micro level. And if necessary, we need to avoid working with those whose causes we strongly oppose and where we cannot remain objective and non-judgmental. And we need to monitor ourselves and be aware of that. So ethical guidelines for working in PCVE. Um, I won't go through them all. Um, they um, can can be read within the paper. I just want to go on to, because I expect I'm getting short of time um, about the importance of ethical practice in this area because I'm sure we're all aware that there has has been um, there has been um, have been psychologists in the states who've been sued for colluding with enhanced inter interrogation techniques and torture. So it it isn't something that hasn't happened actually quite recently in in the current uh, political world in which we're living um, now the international standards are unequivocal both from the un convention against torture and um, the european commission on human rights which prohibits torture and inhuman or degrading punishment which has been upholded by the apa presidential task force who looked in detail at the ethics of working with this population in 2012 um, and stressed that psychologists are bound by the APA ethical principles of their code of conduct in its entirety. entirety. Quite um, st strangely and quite sadly, um, there, there, there is a pushback against that from some psychologists who have said that psychologists, in order to behave consistently with their moral obligations to minimise harm and act virtuously in certain circumstances, do need to participate in torture. Now, I don't think anybody here would leap to support that. Um, so, I just want to commend Norway actually for this um, July 22nd. I'm not going to use the name of the perpetrator ticking time bomb scenario when the, the perpetra perpetrator claimed that the, that the bomb he'd used and, and the a, a, attacks that, had, that pre preceded that were going to be duplicated around the country. And there was a real um, emphasis on we've got to get this intelligence from this guy before this happens. Um, so it, what would have happened and certainly has happened in, in my experience in the in the UK in previous years um, is is that you use um, very coercive interrogation techniques. But in Norway, um, instead, the police used evidence based questioning, rapport building, respect for individual rights and cognitive and strategic interviewing. And all these things led to the truth coming out which um, seems always to be the result of doing things correctly. Um, so 
I just want to just show here the overlap between on the left, we've got the universal principles of ethical psychological practice, which come from the Universal Declaration of Ethical Principles for Psychologists. Again, respect, competent, caring, integrity, responsibility. And on the right, these are the relational tenets of procedural justice. And this is the outcome of research which has demonstrated that you get the best outcomes if you actually respect the person you're interviewing. Um, you let that person be heard and you listen intently. You operate neutrality. You're very careful to manage any bias with openness, sincerity, fairness and transparent, transparency. And then build trust as a result. Um, and there's a piece of research here. I, the references are here later if you want them in the slides, but between um, a very, very good study that's just been published that looks at the procedural justice elements, um, I translates those into aspects of the research which have been looked at in this meta-analytic study and then looks at study outcomes. Um, so you can see that the um, that voice, trustworthiness, neutrality and legitimacy, which are the elements of procedural justice, translate into all these things in terms of the research. And then when it comes to the study outcomes, um, what you get is information gain, rapid disclosure, greater cooperation, reliable admissions and compliance with the law, which is, of course, all consistent with ethical practice. Now, these are the references that I've referred to in these slides. The slides themselves are, are quite self-explanatory. I've, I've gone through them quickly because I don't want to exceed um, my, my time. Um, but the point I really want to make is that behaving well is the best way to get good intelligence and good information and preserve the individual rights of those people who have put themselves at the mercy of, of the state by threatening national security. And that this is, it is incumbent upon us as mental health practitioners in particular, to be able to uphold these values and to model them to other um, actors. Thank you so much, Monica. This was uh, extremely interesting and thorough. And I think, Although you talked primarily about the relevance to mental health practitioners, I think there's a lot of what you said that is very important also for security practitioners and researchers as well. And uh, your really unique insights and experience on this is really valuable, I think, across several sectors. So uh, we will now move on to Anders Bo, who will talk um, um, from a, a different practitioner end of things uh, with his experience and insights from, from Denmark. My name is Anders Bo uh, Christensen. I'm with the uh, Danish Center for Prevention of Extremism, the National Danish Center for Prevention of Extremism. Uh, we are, um, we have like two main tracks of what we do. One is um, develop and disseminate knowledge about prevention of extremism relevant to a Danish context, also strongly inspired by what goes on internationally. And then uh, another track importantly uh, about um, counseling, uh, especially municip municipalities and all the relevant actors uh, with whom they cooperate in this uh, prevention work. We're based uh, under the auspices of the uh, Danish National Ministry of uh, the Danish Ministry of um, Immigration and Integration, so we're not a, a police uh, entity. Now, uh, I'll I'll talk on well um, three smaller topics into one big topic, I suppose. Something a bit uh, first, a bit about the practical organisation of uh, PVE um, from our perspective and then a bit about concern assessment and then thirdly uh, a little bit about knowledge about mental illness and extremism and how we try to um, uh, uh, communicate this very important issue um, to practitioners uh, qu quite widely ac across the board. So uh, just to get the uh, sort of the, the baseline in terms of the uh, practical organization and collaboration in the Danish model for prevention of extremism and, and um, radicalization. There is uh, uh, two sort of um, core components um, to the InfoHouse. If you look at the uh, the box to the right, which is um, 
kind of boxed in with a dotted line. You'll see um, one on the left called the InfoHouse Network. That is uh, uh, chaired by um, by local police. There are 12 police districts in uh, in Denmark, so each of those networks um, uh, cover all 98. Oh, sorry, those 12 networks cover 98 uh, municipalities. So in each uh, network or police district, you will have participation of the relevant uh, municipalities. So there are coordinators from police and each of those municipalities. Um, and then on the um, local level, you have the InfoHouse municipality, where um, actual uh, uh, concern or case concern handling takes place um, across the board. Uh, coordinated between police, um, municipal and other relevant actors. And I think uh, also in view of Monica's um, uh, really interesting presentation, the focus here on is on, on early um, prevention, I should probably add. Now, uh, the InfoHouse model has been um, uh, in place um, as an organizational platform since 2009. And then in late 2020, it was um, I guess uh, a version um, uh, number two was um, re-implemented um, uh, between us, the National Centre for Prevention of Extremism, in collaboration with the National Police. We kind of uh, um, signed uh, across um, across the board, really, on on um, on implementing the model once again as a as a as a set of clear recommendations as to how to, to organise PCVE. Um, prevention uh, locally. Um, and now part of the work that happens um, locally in the InfoHouse municipality is about, um, I guess, coordinating and receiving the uh, the concerns you need for extremism. Um, uh, and this also includes some um, uh, violent extremism. So concerns are received um, within the model on, on, on four uh, possible uh, flows of concern, I guess. One is about uh, uh, psychiatry and health, which would be like one direction if, if the concern could be guided to the info house from. Uh, second one would be prison and probation. Uh, and thirdly, asylum and reception centers. And um, fourth would be um, secured residential uh, institutions. Um, and those are mainly for young people. Um, that have uh, received a conviction and, and are serving their sentence there. So whenever a, a concern is received um, at the um, info house, we have developed um, a, a risk assessment or concern assessment model that is kind of looks at both the welfare and resilience perspectives and also an analysis of the risk, sorry, and, and threat assessment in that particular concern. Um, and if you if we kind of delve into that a bit closer. Now, looking at the analysis of risk and threat, there are four dimensions con uh, concerning convictions and rhetoric, willingness to use violence, a criminal history, and concerning um, a worrisome uh, socialization and relationship. And then on the other side of the board, so to speak, there's analysis of well being and resilience. And as you can see, I've, I've, I've put in, in, um, uh, in relation to today's topic, uh, two dimensions that are also in there, one about uh, personality factors and one about men mental vulnerability in the as part of the analysis, family, network, spare time, activity and education and employment. So this is developed um, uh, you know, taking in uh, all sort of the, the relevant and validated uh, tools or assessment models um, that were already out there. And, and put in, a, in, a, in the prevention of extremism context to support uh, the local info houses in assessing concerns um, at, as, as an early as a stage as, as possible in a qualified and systematic way uh, so that you uh, get a common language of, of, um, of looking at the concern uh, from both police and municipal and other relevant um, actors um, when when actually working your way through the nine dimensions. Now, just an, as an example, uh, dimension number six in the tool uh, is mental vulnerability. And I should probably add that we also provide the, the training for relevant uh, police and um, 
municipal coordinators in using um, this tool. It's it's a, it's a several day uh, training, uh, case based, uh, and the dimension number six here is on mental vulnerability. Uh, and with all the other dimensions, as with this one, there is a definition of mental vulnerability in this um, context, so that you talk from the same um, uh, standpoint, so to speak, when assessing the uh, concern. Uh, and uh, I won't go into detail about the definition as such, but it's important to say that, especially when looking at a at an early uh, a point in the process of, of, of um, assessing a concern that mental vulnerability is often a term used rather than what you can specifically say at that point about whether or not someone is um, mentally ill. So being able to take into the account the, uh, the mental vulnerability perspective is, is quite important and that is also highlighted uh, when looking at uh, practitioners in the field. And there's also a, a per, um, perspective here that, that also works with the other dimensions, uh, looking at uh, what works in this um, uh, particular concern, this particular individual case for concern, and what are the causes for concern, what works well, and what are the uh, causes. So what, in, and that obviously depends on what can be known or what is known about the concern. And that is, um, that is up to the local police and municipal coordinator to make sure that that information uh, is gathered and that happens under the Administration of Justice Act 115, which was um, put into play um, judicially um, quite a long time ago. So there is that uh, early uh, crime prevention perspective already in place. I think it goes back as, as far as the late 1970s or maybe early 80s. So whenever you're looking at an, an early um, concern assessment, that is kind of the overarching uh, umbrella or, or auspices that professionals are working under. And then in terms of, of actually sort of delving into the, um, the process of, of finding out where you um, or how you look at the, the, uh, this particular dimension about mental health or mental vulnerability in the concern, there are some attention points um, that will serve for this dimension as a, a guideline for a qualified and systematic talk across the board in terms of the knowledge of the nature of the concern. And there's also uh, a, a possibility to score moving from red, very few or no resources up to um, a lot of resources, which is obviously obviously the, the green end of the scale. It's important to underline that it's not the it's not the aim for using this model that that everybody should agree on one particular score per dimension, but use this as an invitation to share their professional point of view, or if uh, more importantly, um, it is found out that you need to go back um, to um, whomever addressed him or herself with the concern from say a, a school or um, another kind of institution um, that you have um, a qualified basis on which you um, you address the need for further information to properly assess the concern. So, so these are attention points, I guess, uh, is, is the right word um, that you are recommended to go through if there is um, um, uh, in this particular uh, concern that you're looking at, if there is a dimension of uh, mental uh, vulnerability or even uh, Ill illness or a history about that. Um, now, this is a, a very sensitive uh, topic, like Monica was also saying, and, and that's also true for the uh, for the for the concern assessment in the uh, Danish info house model, especially um, looking at early signs of, um, oh, sorry, not early signs, but early early um, cases for concern uh, of extremism. So, um, so this is helping or put in place to help guiding the uh, assessment and the conversation across the board professionally. We also work like the third topic I was going to touch upon here. We, we work on providing knowledge uh, both about extremism, uh, milieus and, uh, and environments reaching across from both um, uh, extremist, Islamistic um, environments, um, right wing and also left wing, so we're not biased in that sense. And also, importantly, in this context, we've, uh, or my colleagues have put together a, 
uh, a paper on mental illness and extremism and what can research um, um, uh, tell us in, in that regard and to, to kind of form the basis for that and other uh, aspects of, of, uh, of, of a knowledge based knowledge informed uh, prevention um, initiative or effort. Uh, in 2018, uh, my colleagues from the um, knowledge team, I guess you could call them, or <clears throat> performed a, a, a very thorough study or developed a synthesis that was kind of funneling as, as many as about 1700 publications and through a, a, a screening, a peer reviewing and an assessing process ended up with 65 publications that were of solidly relevant to a Danish context anyway and that also fed into the knowledge field about um, mental illness or mental vulnerability and extremism uh, risk or concern um, and on kind of on that track or on that um, path um, we, we we managed to sort of discern a knowledge on both a society level a group level an individual and also a pathway to and from extremism uh, level. So there were um, knowledge available in those four fields or four um, platforms. This is not a hierarchy. These are, uh, the, this is just a model to describe the four um, areas really. And that also uh, gave basis for looking into um, mental vulnerability and extremism. The literature um, uh, from this th synthesis uh, um, I defined the, men the term mental vulnerability, sorry, mental vulnerability as um, mental developmental disorders, depression, diagnosis related, uh, relating to sleep, autism spectrum, schizophrenia, uh, paranoid psychosis. As you can see, uh, a lot of uh, quite a wide range uh, and really important to whenever you look at concerns um, to not um, stigmatize or a kind of um, pre label someone to be in a specific uh, risk um, profile when it comes to extremism. So the literature also states the mental vulnerability does not ambiguously constitute a risk factor for radicalization, but rather one of many risk factors. Um, and also, uh, research from this study anyway um, uh, emphasized that radicalization and participation in terrorist acts or activities may also lead in itself to mental vulnerability as a consequence. This of course, as you can probably tell already, also kind of provided knowledge and a, from a, a somewhat conflicting perspective because some research documents didn't really show an increased incidence of mental illness among terrorists. Uh, there are also a different differentiation to be made between different types of terrorist and diagnosis. Uh, and again, can be mental vulnerability can be one of many uh, factors. Um, and thirdly, here, an increased uh, incidence or certain psych psychiatric diagnosis among lone acts of terrorists compared to, compared to the general population and to members of terrorist groups can also be found in some studies. So it's really important to tread carefully here. So the idea to delve into this to produce a short and brief publication is to 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 provide knowledge for our practitioner level, uh, both municipal police and, and health sector, but this is a very delicate um, subject. So support the practical prevention efforts, point to the issue of stigmatization and, and uh, self-stigmatization um, that people with mental illnesses can or vulnerabilities can already experience and don't add further to that. Um, so the uh, research paper also kind of affirms or is, is in alignment with the uh, synthesis that we produced. Um, and like I said, the uh, there is no uh, clear indication that, uh, that that this is a sort of a standalone uh, risk factor. And also you need more data to say something more conclusive about these things. The data is, is still, in our opinion, uh, somewhat uh, limited. So it, it's it's important to make that holistic like our uh, tools suggest, a nine-dimensional look into the uh, uh, concern assessment. This is the just a, a brief take on the main bibliography that was in the research summary that I just mentioned. Um, so that was what we um, based the uh, the knowledge um, communique on. And um, yes, that was it for me for now. Thank you for listening.
Great. Thank you so much, Anders Bo. I think this was uh, a really interesting and illuminating run through of your experiences and also your, your research. And Denmark is such an interesting country that is being pointed to um, in so many other places across the world. So it's, it's really interesting for, um, for a lot of our audience, I'm sure, to hear your experiences. So with this, um, I will move on to um, Eva Maria. Um, to talk about her experience in, and research in this field, but especially how the pandemic may have impacted on this landscape uh, over the past couple of years. Thank you, Rita. Can you hear me well? Can you see my presentation? No yet? Yeah. Yes, OK. Thank you first uh, for inviting me to this seminar. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to highlight the key points of uh, why we consider the COVID pandemic is an open door for radical ideas and for extreme psychological reaction. We all know that the public health emergencies as COVID pandemic might affect the health, safety and the well-being of both individuals, causing fears and psychosomatic illness as anger, anxiety, frustration, insecurity, etc. and affect as well to the community owing the economic loss, uh, work uh, and schools closures, inadequate resources for medical response and deficient and distribution of necessity. All these effects may translate into a range of emotional reactions, um, um, non-agreement with policies uh, um, and health directives as, such as lockdown, social restriction and vaccination and unhealthy behaviors as well, such as SSC substance abuse, for instance. Uh, we were saying that the COVID-19 pandemic has dramatically changed the life we live adding insecurity and different daily routine, economic pressures and social isolation in our lives. <laughs> Other information, rumors, fake news and misinformation can make us feel out of control and in response, feel the need to react or defend ourselves. All these factors generate a worsening of previous mental health disorders, if any, um, an appearance of new uh, pathological diagnosis, especially stress, anxiety, depression, and increase of substance use. During the pandemic, the well-being of all the society has been severely depleted, and the psychological distress is widespread among the worst population. Disaster normally unit the population of society, but when they drag on in time, then we need to find an escape goat. Being aware of this reality it can be understood how the COVID-19 or rather its psychological consequences has become a um, breeding ground for the generation of radical ideas and violent movements since extremists can find much more easily those who are angry and dissatisfied. They can easily connect with those individuals who are desperately ready for radicalization. That is, they are willing to take action in order to fight against what they consider a limitation of their rights or simply to escape the sensation that uh, flew them daily, which make them orphans of positive or pleasant feelings and overflowing with negativism, anger and resentment. Vulnerable and radical people converge in these dissatisfied and angry groups. In this context of false science and biosis, we can observe how prey and captors go hand in hand, giving to the second ones the possibility of creating networks in changing extremist ideology and sowing violent approaches on the lost. This scenario has generated a new kind of radicalized groups and individuals. Before Corona crisis, the difference between right wing, jihadist and left wing group were quite clear, but now the lines that delimit them are really quite blurry. We can see how the current violent demonstration or riots against COVID measures or supported by conspiracy theories and the nice narrative are made up of groups from the far left to the far right. This is a new reality, anti-system, radical religious and neo-Nazi groups all together. It is even funny to observe former rival acting as a unique group. And also they have different roots and, and, and triumph characteristics. Their triumph and their main goal are the same because now they have a common enemy, governments, politicians, and for the third countries, Western society, especially Europe. 
There is a scene, I guess it's an Arabic proverb, which says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And it is based in the concept that two parties who has a common enemy must be able to work together to obtain a joint victory against that enemy. And we can currently see that phenomenon. So we should review and deepen into the element that predict violent actions and behaviors and into those mechanisms which prevent and manage the processes of radicalization from a mental health perspective in order to understand how the COVID pandemic is an open window for radical ideas on for extreme psychological reactions. That means that we should incorporate some extra variable and, and groups in our working backpack. The convergence between radicalization ideology and the psychological effects of the pandemic is real and um, has profound social, community and political implications since the radicalized and extremist group no longer seeks their potential victims and members within social organization or in religious or political communities but now deep into the ghettos of those affected by COVID at the, so the psycho, social and community level, and among those who have previously demonstrated against government's policies to contain the virus. For instance, we should study social movements like one on followers of conspiracy narratives or radical anti-vaccine movements. And we should also incorporate inside this equation refugees and illegal immigrant groups, since refugees camps and in immigrant centers were one of the biggest sources of radicalization in and against Western society. And they are even more so now in the new pandemic era due to the increase of the economic difference and opportunity in between third and Western countries. Then, we could open a new rule where studying, assessing and discussing the new social movement and we might explore and incorporate other target groups and audiences into the mental health umbrella. It is true that the threat of extremism and violence idea has been always present. There is nothing new. The current problem is the magnitude of the threat because it's a common one. The problem that we face now is that the roots of these new violent extremist ideas and, and movements are similar worldwide. I mean, I will not be radicalized by something that doesn't affect me. What's happening in a village of Asia is hardly going to alter my values, thoughts and ideologies. But we are dealing right now with a global threat, the COVID pandemic. However, just as the threat is seen as something global, something that affects uh, every single one, the response has been very different from different countries and institutions. There has been a lot of confusion and that helps to generate misinformation, rejection, anger, hatred, etc. Crisis as the COVID one, great frustration and favor the most radical ideas and in general support leaders who take a hard line against what in theory provoked that crisis those who promote revenge and retaliation. Then one of the key points is, how could we explain to those who consider themselves the true saviors of their society, the only one who are doing something to protect their community, that they might be part of the problem? And a second point is, why some vulnerable people has been radicalized during the pandemic, while others not? From the point of the mental health, the response are very diverse, but the most influential is the level of residence of people on community. Uh, and the skill that arise when managing the process of psycho psychosocial grief, since violence and extremist groups normally offer the power to get out of the tunnel of uh, insecurity and desolation through adventure and adrenaline through the feeling of identity or revelation and through the redemption of our past burdens. In other words, there are groups that offer safe and immediate resources to people who have a low psychological threshold regarding obtaining personal benefits, which they consider to deserve and that the pandemic has taken away from them to the expense of third parties. Therefore, from a mental health we need to work now on increasing the resilience to frustration in the same way that we were on grieving processes. Corona crisis has been seen as a social grief. Um, the root one, we need to make normal some emotions that are not pleasant to us since 
We live in the society of happiness and positivism. We are always, we are not always to feel bad, to feel sad, depressed, blue. But these types of feelings are logical and normal in the context in which we are living right now. What is not normal is the pandemic, but the feeling that this pandemic producing us is totally normal. And we must allow people to feel down, recognize this emotion and find ways, find ways to overcome it because it will be the only way to face it and to heal our bones. Being honest, all these matches of the type that it doesn't matter if the external conditions are bad because you must, you have to be happy anyway, really annoyed me. So we need to show people how to advance in the different phases of the social grief. This means giving them the skill and psychological instruments to guide them in how to deal with frustration and emotional suffering since we have never been touched and live with discomfort. Let me now talk about conspiracy and mental health. Conspiracy theories are a mental health crisis as well. During these two latest years, due to the pandemic, people are not receiving the care they need and um, so they are finding themselves believing baseless conspiracy theories or nonsense ideologies. This idea has been particularly popular when thinking about the support of quantum, uh, virus deniers and anti-vaccine groups. Let's dive into this issue. Every day, people who spend time online face a deluge of conspiracy theories, misinformation and disinformation. Plenty of them move along clicking paths of the landish or false content that has been designed to lure them in. So, however, becoming trippy for reasons that we mental health experts don't fully understand. And thanks to algorithms like the one that drew many into quantum, people quickly slip into that corner of the internet and find a community of believers or even siblings who swear they have discovered hidden truth and forbidden knowledge. These people might rightfully distract government authority, find political polarization in view writing and search for information that confirms their own views, all of which could make them more vulnerable to fast fools and to radical groups. Recent researches suggest that their mental health can influence what they are willing to believe. Some study has shown that conspiracy theories appear to people with unmet psychological needs. They crave knowledge, desire safety and security, and need to maintain a positive self-esteem. The conspiracy theories, which may sometimes be true, help to explain the unknown, giving people a deep sense of satisfaction. That relief, however, can be temporary, and other study has shown the conspiracy theory are associated with anxiety, social isolation and negative emotions. A new wave of research conducted during the COVID pandemic suggests a plausible connection between insecurity, anxiety and depression and an increased likelihood of believing conspiracy theories. Perhaps with so much beyond understanding, people look for answers wherever such revelation might be found. Inside was plain full of YouTube, Facebook, Telegram, Twitter, and other media platforms where rumors, rifter, and conspiracy theorists shared the truth as they saw it to people who wanted that what fee, very few could offer them, security and answers. That confidence became an antidote to the misery of not knowing what might could happen next. People who immerse themselves in this swamp of polluted information has expressed provocation with and distress over solving riddles and clues, waiting anxiously for predictions to come true and even breaking relationship with their loved ones through their beliefs and increases insulation. If their mental health had not been poor prior to their involvement of this online community, it seemed to decline the deeper they got. The complex relationship between mental health and false information then has far-reaching effects yet overlooked. The field of research is relatively new and overfunded. There is also a concern about pathologizing certain beliefs and views, yet it's becoming increasingly clear that without the force to meaningfully address people's mental health needs before and after they become deeply involving conspiracy theories and disinformation, 
we will make little progress toward so defeating the dishonesty of dialogue on discourse. All are consequences of like this. Coping radicalization in times of, of COVID, it's more than ever a social problem that if done inappropriately, directly affects the mental health of people. Hence, the urgent needs to teach all the community level not to stigmatize or reject any group of individual due to the pandemic. And the obligation as a society to pay more attention to the pathology and psychological consequences generated by the COVID, converting them from its first signal and manifestation. In general, the majority of people with mental health illness are not violent. Instead, they are more likely to be victims of violence. Terrorists are rarely diagnosed with mental illness or typically exhibit traits like focus, strategy thinking, and planning as execution, which help them accomplish complex and violent aims. So we don't need to expect that people who have behaviors like domestic terrorists will also be grappling with severe mental illness. We suspect the pressure of the pandemic, including insecurity, anxiety, fear, and isolation, push people closer toward embracing a set of false and improbable views that offer security to believers. We often think that trauma can serve as triggers for radicalization. Just to end, I would like to, 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 to name some quotes or different authors about these issues. Uh, Moskalenko um, said that some people who already had mental health issues probably were speci especially vulnerable to this rabbit hole like social environments online into which there were skisses during pandemic isolation. She also stressed that it was the perfect storm that drake a lot of people into this swampy landscape of conspiracy theories where there is this online community that assess you and welcome your creativity. Monscalesco Mon Mon also affirmed that to solve the problem of conspiracy theories equal to a mental health crisis, we must address the COVID's mental health crisis first. On the other hand, those with higher emotional resilience or the cell versus ability to bounce back quickly from hard time and setbacks are less likely to endorse a number of conspiracy narrative. Another author, Meller, believes that while media intervention like fact-checking are important, we overlook the motivation behind why people turn to conspiracy narrative and disinformation. She described the dynamic as copying by conspiracy and she says, that figuring out more effective ways to regain control when they're feeling like they are losing control or feeling uncertain, it as important as the media literacy side. The more negative someone felt about themselves and others, the more likely they were to believe conspiracy narrative about COVID. Positive self scheme, however, were protected against those conspiracy beliefs. People with more positive views on themselves who might believe they are good and successful person could have an easier time seeing their own virtue even when going through a difficult time. Finally, uh, the Coney describes uh, the conspiracy narrative as the feature of the mind that shapes searching and control in time of insecurity and stress. And that sense, he wrote, people with a tendency to make negative association and inference might be far more vulnerable to the lure of the conspiracy theory. In summary, there is no playbook for integrating mental health into our understanding of this information, conspiracy narrative of frustration during COVID pandemic. Yet it's clear time to rethink what our collective vulnerability to this information or to suffer uh, a, psychosocial, a psychosocial crisis could look like if people learned copying and resilience skill early in life. If people had access to quality mental health treatment when they need it, and if they could draw on community support during time of hardship and insecurity. Thank you for your attention. Um, that's for my part.
Thank you so much, Eva. This was a really valuable reminder of how important this issue is, and perhaps now um, more than ever. Um, I will. Uh, we have received a few questions from the audience, and I thought I would I will summarize these. Uh, there are three questions that we received so far. I will summarize these three questions, and then. Uh, we go through each one of you and you can comment on uh, the ones that you find most relevant and then, then we may be able to take another round after that. So the first question uh, was from Nils Duits. Um, he asks why use the relatively unknown concept of mental vulnerability rather than uh, more known definitions for psychopathology or so that was um, his questions. I think it was directed to Anders, but um, any of you would uh, be free to reply, of course. Um, then there are another two questions um, regarding the connection between uh, mental illness and different roles in the terrorist organization. So are there different mental illnesses or perhaps other mental health issues that could be important for different roles in, um, in terrorist organizations? And I guess that you could uh, take this a step further and also perhaps reply if there are different issues arising from solo actors versus group actors. Um, then it's uh, the third question regards the info house model specifically, but I also think it's it could be applicable to a wider context. So does um, does this model or in general, what uh, what are your thoughts around whether um, mental illness could be a key driver of a radicalization process or if it is a risk or perhaps a vulnerability factor for either violence or involvement in violent extremism. Um, I think we could uh, start with the order that we did the presentation. So if if Monica, would, if you would like to comment on any of these that you find worth commenting on first, and then we move directly on to Anders and then to Eva. Are you there, Monica? Uh, okay, perhaps we start with Anders and then we take Eva and then Monica at the end. Sorry. Okay, <coughs> yes, Monica. Oh, right, okay. I, I forgot, forgot to unmute myself and uh, <laughs> no problem I was at talking, all. talking away to myself. Um, I noticed that the word vulnerability has come up twice. Once in the first question about why use this concept of vulnerability, which isn't a, a psychiatric one, really. And the third question of can mental health be a, a key driver or is it a vulnerability? Um, I think it's all a question of semantics, isn't it, really? I suppose if we're saying that something is a vulnerability, it means that you are um, you've, you've, you've got a condition or a need that can be met by engagement in an extremist ideology. So, um, but that isn't in itself um, the, the full explanation because there will be a range of multiple needs that are met by engaging in an extremist ideology. So, um, vulnerability, vulnerability is just a, is a generic term. Um, and then you, you have to ask whether that is actually motivating in itself the uh, um, the violence or whether it is contributing to a complex of um, needs uh, that are in themselves um, taking you along a trajectory which is going to get to the stage that you may or may not in, in, in engage in terrorist violence. So I suppose that where mental health is a key driver it is in the areas that where it has been identified more often in lone actors in terms of autistic spectrum disorder um, or psychosis, uh, paranoid schizophrenia and so on. If you consider somebody who is hearing voices telling them that um, 
the, the West is, is, is decadent and victimising of Muslims. Muslims are better than Christians, therefore we need to restore our natural supremacy, then that is driving terrorist violence. Um, that is very, very rare, I have to say. All the prevalence studies indicate that something as clear cut as this me mental illness is functionally linked to a terrorist outcome is very, very rare. What we normally have is a complex of difficulties that create a susceptibility um, to adopting um, a, 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 an identity and a role that gives you a sense of esteem, notoriety, um, identity, meaning, belonging, or ex excitement and adventure, whatever it is in the individual case, that means that this is a shortcut to getting, to finding your place in society, which hasn't happened up until now. So I'm sorry, it's a, it's a long winded answer that really ranges across these three questions. I, I hope that that's um, clarified things a bit. Thank you so much, Monica. And then uh, Anders, would you like to respond? You're muted, Anders. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get back on. Sorry, you are. I, uh, uh, sorry, Monica, I didn't hear your uh, uh, any of your answers because I was um, I was disconnected here. Can you hear me? OK, thank yes, you. Sir. All right. I think uh, I was starting with the uh, with the point from Nils about mental. Oh, sorry, the, the vulnerability question. I just heard Monica embarking on that when I was uh, <laughs> when I was uh, disconnected. Anyway, um, like I said in the presentation, it, in the perspective here, and I would like to underline the fact that I'm neither a doctor nor a, a psychiatrist, that looking at it from an early concern or a, a prevention perspective, it's important, uh, we find it important to to look into the uh, well, balance, I suppose, uh, that you can, or the nuances of what mental health or mental vulnerability issues might be at stake or might be part of a, of a, of a holistic or a total picture, which is why it's, it's um, labeled or mentioned in the methodology that I uh, briefly mentioned in the presentation as a vulnerability. Uh, because I guess when, our, when, our, when a concern is at an early stage, you are not necessarily sure as a professional uh, coordinating the information on this, um, what is actually at play, whether it is um, uh, an, uh, an illness or something that's already recognized or, or diagnosed or um, more along the lines of a vulnerability perspective. So there's kind of that um, balance uh, in there. That was and that was what we found in the knowledge synthesis also about that um, perspective. And then there's also, of course, the um, the more um, I would like to use the phrasing hardcore or, or maybe sort of the more um, specific diagnosed um, so picture, sorry, the more specific picture of, of a diagnosis being, being known, but that is not necessarily the case when working with the model that, um, that I described. That's not necessarily a premise that you know that when you're looking at a concern, but looking into what's at play in that particular concern, you might find that it's not just a sign of vulnerability, but the vulnerability is maybe also root caused in an illness. So it's in order to, I don't know if that makes any sort of clearer sense, but it's all you know, it's it's um, uh, systematic set up to to um, respectfully, I guess, and holistically look at the entire um, picture and not jump forward and conclude that illness is at play or a diagnosis should be the next thing happening in an uh, eventual effort. I hope that was kind of um, kind of a clear answer. Yes, thank you very much. Would you like to respond to the final question as well? That was also uh, directed at um, in the. the yeah, can you, can you repeat that, please? Yes, of course. Um, whether, I mean, you have responded to it in part, but uh, uh, two questions actually that were one is whether different mental health issues may have different roles for different. Um, uh, types within a terrorist organization and also how your infohouse model takes into account the, the, the stage of the process where mental health 
could play a role? I mean, you partly answered this already. But. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah, right. The, the first part of the question, I think maybe I would leave to someone more expert than myself uh, because the um, the uh, the knowledge disseminator, sorry, the knowledge synthesis doesn't really put me in that position uh, as, an, as an expert in, into linking different kinds of illnesses to terrorist uh, activity um, as such. But in terms of the info how or the question on, on the uh, on involving health sector in the info house structure, well, I guess basically uh, th several things could be said. Like when we re um, kind of re-implemented the model, it was uh, based on, uh, on, on quite a thorough process involving all the relevant actors, among those being uh, health, health uh, sector professionals who needed uh, somewhere specific to get a first um, a first place or a, a, a direct way of being able to address a concern for extremism to the info house and therefore one of the channels or one of the um, uh, um, concern flows I guess was specifically labeled or named um, um, mental health or a psychiatric um, uh, um, track or, or trace really um, so so that is not a perfect setup, but it's an attempt to make it clear for anyone working within health sector outreach or treatment that if you have a concern, there is a, a way to um, to address that to a, a coordinated reception. And if it turns out that based on the assessment using the model, it, you might need more information about that particular concern, then there's also um, an awareness with the dimension that uh, you should contact, make contact to find out what kind of uh, or to what level mental illness or mental vulnerability is part of the uh, uh, concern picture. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Eva, would you like to comment on these questions, please? Thank yes. you. And yes. I will just remind the, the ones of you who are not speaking, if you could please press the mute button so we avoid the echo. Thank you. OK. I will be very brief, uh, yes, because my colleague has mentioned more or less that the main, the main argument. But uh, we prefer use the the um, vulnerability instead of uh, speaking about psychiatric disorder first to stop the stigma and bias. That's the first question. And second, because yes, the ten percent of the population has some kind of personality disorder, but all of us, and I repeat, all of us could be radicalized. All of us has a price. And when I say a price, I don't mean economical issues. I mean, what will be a condition that we have to face to be involved in our violent actions, in, in radical behavior? So uh, that's because we say that we prefer to, to mention vulnerability of these people, of this population, because they have more conditions, more uh, variable of those ones that we are looking for in order to collective uh, trait the, the level of radicalization of, of a person, but that people doesn't have to, to, to be incorporated in any diagnosis, in any psychiatric diagnosis. In fact, the people who has mental illness, they are not normally violent person. In fact, they are victims of these radical groups. Um, about the second question, if we consider that uh, we can find different mental health um, traits in different roles in the terrorist organization, yes, of course, and we could uh, be talking for hours about these issues, but uh, yes, to, to say some example, if we are thinking in FTF, in, in foreign uh, terrorist uh, returnees, they normally uh, present the same psychological profile that those that we see in, in, in victims from domestic violence, just to say an example, because they have been, they feel that they depend from others and they have been um, captors, um, they have been, they, they have suffered sexual aggressors, abuse, etc. If we, if we focus on long after, they normally have they are looking for identity, so they normally have a very low self thing. If we speak about the more violent terrorists, they have a problem to control the anger, to control the stress. They will have a high level of narcissism, maybe even high love thing. So we will find different psychological tries in order to, 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 to define the different profile of terrorist organization. And the last question, 
If the mental health illness is a key driver for radicalization and vulnerability, of course, uh, when we see at the beginning that we are not focused in, in, in looking for, for psychiatric uh, disorder, but we know that there is some conditions, some psychological and social adjustment that are going to make someone more vulnerable to be part of this group. Because the groomer, the recruiter know very well how to make a profile in between the community, online or face-to-face -face community, and they will detect this psychological trait who make us more vulnerable, more vulnerable. And this is the psychological admit that make a person to be more likelihood to be captured for the organization. But I repeat, all of us, in some particular phases of our life could be in the process of radical sites and all of that could be captured by some organization who wanted to give us something that someone else has never offered. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have very much time, but I just want to throw in one last question for you all to reflect on uh, very briefly, if you if you can. And that is um, the question of um, risk communication and uh, finding a joint language on this. We have already discussed the differences between uh, vulnerabilities, risks, uh, also mental illness, mental vulnerabilities, uh, we have touched upon the risk of violence versus the risk of other kind of engagement in terrorism and violent extremism, the risk of being radicalized or being a radicalizer. So there's a lot of um, perhaps seemingly fine distinctions here, but that could have massive impact on practice. So what are your thoughts on uh, the process of formulating a, a joint language here? Um, because this is by nature a field that is dependent on cross-sectorial and even within research often cross-disciplinary cooperation. So what do you see the prospects of actually effective communication on these issues um, and uh, where, where are we moving in this regard? We could start with, uh, with Monica again and then take the same order as previous time. Thank you. Uh, hello, can I be seen and heard? <laughs> um, right, risk communication. Well, uh, I, I think it is a fraught area. And I suppose there's two words that I have particularly been concerned about uh, over the years, which I think that as those who are working as specialists in this area, we need to be very clear about between us. And they are radicalization and terrorism. <laughs> and uh, radicalization itself, it's very clear that you don't actually have to be radicalized to take part in a terrorist attack. Um, there's this concept of um, multifinality that you can start on a trajectory of radicalization but actually come off it at any point and end up in, in another place entirely. And also the concept of equifinality, that there are lots of different pathways that get you to a terrorist attack as well. So the word radicalization is very, very imprecise and doesn't really help with the degree of rigor that we need if we're going to be talking in an accurate way in, in this area. Um, which is one of the reasons why when I was working in this area, we always separated out engagement from intent, the mindset of intent, um, because they're all subsumed in the word radicalization. But many people are engaged in ideology in some way, but have absolutely no intention of committing a terrorist uh, offence. Therefore, radicalization there helps not at all, except to muddy the waters. So I would like to think that we could all, those of us who are working as specialists in this field in, in the area of risk assessment, can actually be very much more disciplined about the use of the word radicalization. Um, and the other one itself is terrorism. And I discovered to, to, to my own shock, <laughs> the first time I spoke to a very senior um, 
PLO terrorist who'd been in prison for, I think, 28 years. And I thought, well, this is a what I call a senior prisoner. I'm going to have a, just an open conversation with him about this area of interest because my job had become uh, one of identifying pathways into terrorism by talking to those who were convicted. I started with him and I, I referred to him as a terrorist and he was absolutely furious with, <laughs> with the label and with me. And it set off a rant that actually um, continued for, for about three hours during which I was trying to get my opportunity to come in and apologise and start again and rewind, but I never got it. Um, he was very, very angry to see himself with, with that label. And it's very clear that that label is, is a value judgment and it depends where you sit, what your perspective is on who's the terrorist and, and who's the innocent victim. Um, and state actors do the same. Um, Assad, for example, will refer to those who might seek a more democratic form of government as, as terrorists because they're undermining his authority and his power. So, and there's a very important distinction to be made as well between um, what an individual wants to achieve and whether that's seen as, as equivalent to terrorism or what they would do to achieve it. So, um, Others would say, you can't call me a terrorist because I would never condone attacks on civilians. And terrorism actually means that you are prepared to attack civilians to make your, to further your cause. And I would only ever choose um, a government or a military target because those people represent more closely the enemy. So they would also re reject the word terrorist. Um, and then you ask, well, OK, what what are your objectives? And the objectives can be quite benign. But they for example, one guy I spoke to said, I want to restore Muslim to have equal value with other faiths, with Judaism, with Christianity and so on. I mean, I could find, see nothing wrong in that. But what he would do to achieve it was where the risk lay. And he was prepared to carry out um, bombings in um, uh, Somalia. He was travelling to Somalia when he was uh, arrested in, in order to achieve that benign objective. So there's so much more nuance in any of in all these words um, and they're used very casually. And I just feel that if we're in a group of experts who are charged with making nuanced decisions, we need to have a shared understanding of how careful we need to be in language because it embodies quite a lot of perspective, privilege and value judgment. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll just move straight on to Anders Bo and then to Eva for a few brief comments before we ha have to finish um, in a few minutes. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, am I on audio? You can hear me. OK, cool. Thank you. Um, Right, that's a hard one to follow, but thank you, Monica. <laughs> um, I think, uh, as I recall, or I noted the question, it was on risk communication. Well, like I said in the presentation that I started out with, the um, the one of the sort of overarching perspectives from where we're at is also looking at the early sort of preventive perspective or analysis. So I, I think maybe I wouldn't communicate as, as much about uh, risk communication, but maybe kind of tone it down a bit to awareness in a, in, a, in a broader picture. So when looking at professionals, the professionals that we are supporting, but from both police, municipal, health and so forth, uh, we always um, take, when it comes to the uh, mental health perspective, we always take into account that it needs to be communicated at, as part of a, of a of a larger picture and thus not a risk in and of itself. And I think part of that perspective was was quite well put by my Monica and the examples that you came up with. So I would um, probably not, not also not being a mental health expert myself, I would uh, look at a broader awareness um, picture, if you like, to support professionals in working with the uh, concern assessment on a holistic, or not, sorry, on a on a holistic frame. Thank you. I hope that was an answer to something. 
Yes, thank you. thank you so much. And um, we will now let Eva have a few last words. Thank you. Uh, I had a problem with the... Yes? Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I had a problem with the technology. I think that all of us had that today. Yes, to be very brief, yes, as Monica and Andrew said, the, the language is very important, especially in the area that we are working in. Um, uh, I have written many papers and articles, especially in, in the area of intervention program that they label this intervention program with uh, the name of de-radicalization. We don't want to change the mind of anyone. We need to respect the ideology, the feelings, the emotion and, uh, and the ideas even the harder that they can be, we have to respect that. It's the only way to work with radicals, vulnerable people. We have to respect in the way that they want to live and they want to think. This is something that we cannot enter in, but we need to change in the way that they face that ideology. When they, they, they use violent behaviors to protect them, to defend the ideology, this is the only thing that we can change. So it's much better to avoid use the radicalization concept because we have another one disengagement i think that monica has mentioned this some people can think something similar is totally different it's totally different when we apply kind of disengagement program we are respecting the people we are respecting their background we are respecting how they wanted to be integrated in the community. We only are giving them the idea that you can be part of this community, respecting others as well. But they already have the, the same the same duty to respect your ideas, feelings, etc. Um, especially when we were in, in, in ethics area, uh, we were with formats. They normally say my clients when they wanted to, to name the people who has been radicalized. I don't like neither this terminology because we need to teach the community that we, we cannot afford don't work with X, with formats, with radicalized people or with terrorists. But they don't really understand us because they consider that we are wasting our money, our time, because they are kind of most that it's impossible to change their mind. But if, even if we name them as client, it's supposed that they are giving money to us. And as you know, the client has always rise. So it's much better to name this, uh, the, 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 the assessment people, the vulnerable population, the inmates, if we are working in prison context, but never say client. It's something that really, really suppressed me because uh, they are not paying us. Thank you. That's my, my two boil point. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Eva, and thank you to all of you and uh, for this extremely rich and uh, valuable uh, discussion and presentations from all of you. Uh, and I'm sorry to the audience for the slight technical difficulties along the way, and let's hope that next time we we'll meet it will be in person instead. Um, so thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.